Welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content and wish to see it continue, become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noel Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Dear listeners, we asked for support in our last episode, and a number of you came through. To our new supporters, including Dan and Jill K, Jackie A, Teresa D N, and Bethany S, we are deeply grateful. We still need a good deal more support, but the positive reaction we received just since our last episode has shown us that so many of you do value this content. Yes, we absolutely love doing this podcast, and we get lots of positive feedback, more than 300 ratings on Apple Podcasts, so we know we have a lot of appreciative listeners. Now, we need listeners to become supporters. Yes. This podcast takes from 15 to 20 hours of our time every week to write, record, and promote, and that's a significant chunk of time. Please become a supporter to help us get back to doing it on a weekly basis. If you go to AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support, you have two options to become a monthly supporter, Locals or Patreon. The support tiers are the same on both, with the lowest tier being just $5 a month. Just $5. On both systems, you'll get exclusive content like our American Catholic History Conversations and on-location videos and opportunities for video chats. But Locals is more about building community and having greater engagement among our fans, not just with us. And if you're able to give it a higher level than $5, we have additional perks available. So please, if you value American Catholic History, become a supporter. Because, like we said before, we like to eat food. Maybe a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> And keep the lights on. And we want to keep producing this podcast. Learn more at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. So that said, and thank you for your support, on with the show. Today we're talking about two Roman martyrs whose skeletal remains ended up in a historic Louisville, Kentucky church. Now, this subject was actually mentioned to us on the SQPN Discord by a user named Eric Bear. So, Eric Bear, thank you for the story. Yes, indeed. Louisville, our longtime listeners will recall, is where the diocesan see of Bardstown moved in 1841. So, Louisville, dating back to its 1808 founding in Bardstown, is one of the five oldest dioceses in the United States, and it is the oldest inland diocese in the country. Every other diocese, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, were along the East Coast. So the Archdiocese of Louisville has its own storied history. It has figured in a number of our earlier episodes, and there are still many stories to tell, like the life and work of the saintly first bishop of Barstown and Louisville, Benedict Joseph Leger. I honestly can't believe we haven't done that episode. <laughs> I know, yet. seriously. And we'll talk about Louisville when we talk about the Bloody Monday riots of 1855. In fact, today's topic crosses paths with the story of the 1855 Bloody Monday riots in Louisville, but we'll get into that later. Right. And Louisville is the home base of our pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon country. It's a surprisingly Catholic city, and today's topic is woven into the story of Catholic Louisville. The topic is St. Martin of Tours Parish and the remains of two Roman martyrs, Saints Bonosa and Magnus, which are housed in St. Martin's. So let's start with some information about St. Martin of Tours Parish. It was founded as a parish in 1853 and named in honor of the patron saint of the Bishop of Louisville, Martin John Spaulding. It was the fourth Catholic parish in the city of Louisville and the second parish for German Catholic immigrants. The growth of the city during this time was largely Irish and Germans, and most of them were Catholic. The first German parish, St. Boniface, is only a half mile away from St. Martin. St. Boniface was established in 1836. Only the parish of St. Louis was founded earlier in 1830, and St. Louis eventually became the cathedral and was renamed in honor of the Assumption of Mary. So in one of America's earliest important Catholic cities, St. Martin of Tours was among the earliest Catholic parishes. One way that St. Martin is connected to St. Boniface is that it was immediately given into the care and ministry of the Franciscans who were based in Cincinnati and who had already taken over St. Boniface. These Franciscans were immigrants from Germany, mostly Bavaria, so they were a natural fit to come to Louisville and take over care of the two parishes dedicated to serving the German population. So St. Boniface and now St. Martin were Franciscan-led parishes with rapidly growing populations thanks to immigration. One distinction that St. Martin has over St. Boniface, however, is having an older church building. 
The present St. Boniface was built in the 1890s because the previous church was just too small. The current church is a stunningly beautiful and very well-preserved neo-Gothic church. We visited it on our last pilgrimage to Kentucky. St. Martin, on the other hand, is still the original church built in the early 1850s. This means that it, along with the present Cathedral of the Assumption, which was also built in the early 1850s, are two of the very few public buildings in Louisville that predate the Civil War. But St. Martin almost didn't make it to the Civil War. No, St. Martin was only two years old when it was nearly burned down. In 1855, our old pals, the Know-Nothings, became greatly alarmed by the rapid increase of the Catholic population of Louisville. They didn't want Catholics voting because they believed that Catholics would simply vote exactly as the Pope wanted them to, and eventually the Pope would come and take over America and make it his new headquarters. The Know-Nothings have featured in a few previous episodes. They tarred and feathered Father John Baptist in May. They stole and busted up the Pope's stone, a slab of marble that Pope Pius IX sent over to be included in the Washington Monument. In 1844 in Philadelphia, they rioted and burned down lots of Catholic homes, businesses, and two churches just because Catholics wanted to use a Catholic Bible in the public school education. And their successors, the Ku Klux Klan, certainly did their share of anti-Catholic activity, including gunning down Father James Coyle in cold blood in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, in 1855, the Know-Nothings in Louisville wanted to stop Catholics from voting, and they feared that Catholics were stockpiling weapons in St. Martin's. So they did the natural thing. They rioted, burned down a lot of Catholic homes and businesses, and tried to burn down St. Martin. Hundreds were injured and 20 were killed. That was the Bloody Monday riot, which you mentioned before. We'll do a more in-depth episode on that in the future, but for our purposes, we'll just leave it there. St. Martin survived that attack, and three years later, the German Catholic population had grown so much that in 1858, the church had to be expanded to its present size and cruciform shape. Also in 1858, Ursuline nuns came over from Germany at the invitation of the pastor to start a school for girls. In 1863, the Zaverian brothers came over to establish a school for boys. The rest of the 19th century saw more additions and renovations, but the greatest arrival was still to come. This happened in 1901. The pastor of St. Martin, Monsignor Francis Zabler, petitioned Rome for relics. Not an unusual thing for a pastor to do. Relics are an important part of Catholic devotion, and parishes are great places to have relics available for veneration. But he was not expecting the response that he got. So let's fly over to Rome and see about the response. The Pope at the time, Leo XIII, had taken a keen interest in the growth of the church in America. One reason was the relative peace that prevailed in the United States. There was sectarian strife, but it wasn't large-scale persecution by the government. Compared to Europe, things were very calm. So he was only too happy to fulfill this request for relics, as he suddenly had a great need to find places outside of Italy to send relics for safekeeping. Yes, this was because by the turn of the 20th century, the Italian peninsula had been unified into the Kingdom of Italy. For centuries, the peninsula had been governed by a patchwork of kingdoms and republics, with the Papal States dominating the middle portion of the peninsula. But Italian nationalism and some very effective leaders brought about a unification of the peninsula under the new Kingdom of Italy. In 1870, Rome itself fell to the Italians, though they stopped at the Leonine Wall, which rings Vatican City. That tiny patch of land they left to the Pope. The Pope at the time, Pius IX, refused to accept the legitimacy of the Italian government, and for 59 years, from 1870 through 1929, the Popes didn't leave the Vatican. This included Pope Leo XIII, the immediate successor to Pius IX. The Italian kingdom had a very anti-Catholic streak, as, and as it conquered territory, it suppressed religious communities and confiscated or destroyed church property. We talked about this before when we talked about how U.S. President Chester A. Arthur had intervened to prevent the Italian government from taking over the North American College Seminary building. In that case, Americans were living in a church-owned building that the Italian government intended to seize. Through some quick international telegraphy and the involvement of Jacob Astor, the Italian government left that building alone thanks to the intervention of President Arthur. Well, one building that didn't enjoy American protection was an abbey of Cistercian nuns in the town of Agnani, about 40 miles east of Rome. This abbey had been home to the skeletal remains of two 3rd or 4th century Roman martyrs, Bonosa and Magnus. 
Tradition holds that St. Bonosa was a Christian and a virgin, and she was condemned to death for her faith. It happened either during the persecution of Emperor Septimius Severus in the early 3rd century, or during the persecution of Diocletian in the early 4th century. Either way, Bonosa was facing her death, and a centurion named Magnus was moved by her witness. Magnus either professed a conversion to Christianity right there and was thus sentenced to death with her, or he actually jumped into the arena to save her life and was also himself killed. Either way, tradition holds that they were martyred together. Their bodies were interred next to one another in the catacombs of Ponciani. As with so many early Roman martyrs, the definite details of their lives are not known, but their status as revered martyrs of the early church was unquestioned. And they remained in peaceful repose in the catacombs until 1700. That year, a new Cistercian abbey opened in the town of Anagni, east-southeast of Rome. Anagni had a long history of papal attention, whether as a place of respite or being used as the site of official actions. It was close to Rome, but secluded up in the hills. So when the Cistercians opened their abbey, Pope Clement XI authorized transferring the skeletons of Bonosa and Magnus to be venerated in the Cistercian abbey there in Anagni. Bonosa and Magnus remained in that abbey under papal protection for nearly 200 years. But when the papal states fell and the forces of Italy came along, those old bones needed a new home, lest they fall into rough hands. And once again, America came through, not by saving the building, but providing a place where the relics would be safe from anti-Catholic marauders. Now, if this sounds familiar to our longtime listeners, it should. A similar thing had happened just a few decades earlier in the German-speaking parts of Europe. Nationalist fervor brought about wars of unification. Anti-Catholic policies required the confiscation and destruction of lots and lots of church property. One of the most important men saving relics in that case was Father Sutbert Mullinger, a Belgian priest who was a pastor in Pittsburgh. He used his family money and connections to rescue thousands of relics. His collection became so vast that he built St. Anthony Chapel near his parish to house them all. That collection now numbers over 5,000 relics, and it is the largest collection of relics outside the Vatican. We told that story in a previous episode. Well, this is another case like that. Relics were threatened. A Catholic church in America was willing to take them in. So the relics were sewn into bags and shipped across the ocean to fulfill the request of Monsignor Zabler. We should note that it isn't clear that the Cistercian Abbey in Anagni ever was suppressed or sacked. In fact, the Cistercian Order still uses it as their mother house. So even if they were suppressed for a time or the building confiscated, it didn't last and the building clearly wasn't destroyed. So it's possible that Bonosa and Magnus would have remained safe there. But Pope Leo XIII couldn't take a chance. He had them packed up and shipped over the ocean just to be sure. The holy skeletons were received with great reverence. They were dressed in royal garments, crowned symbolizing their martyrdom were placed above their skulls, and they were displayed in repose in glass front sarcophagi under side altars in St. Martin. And there they rested in veneration, unbothered for more than 100 years. In 2012, during a restoration of St. Martin of Tours, the sacred relics were exhumed once again. The badly deteriorated 111-year-old garments were replaced with new garments. Then, amid the pomp and splendor of a fully decked out solemn high mass, in Latin, as appropriate for these Roman martyrs who likely spoke Latin, they were reinterred in a new sarcophagi, safe for another century of public veneration. But before they were reinterred, an archaeologist from the University of Louisville named Philip de Blasi was given the opportunity to study them. He determined that the female skeleton was of a woman of about 24 years old, and she was 100% Caucasian. The male skeleton was of a man of mixed African and European descent, and in his late 40s. So, while absolute confirmation is impossible, these findings are consistent with the tradition about who they are and what they did. So, that's how two Roman martyrs came to be interred in a Louisville church. And if you join us on our next pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, you'll have the opportunity to pray at their tombs. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters, including exclusive content, books, mugs, and personal conversations. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org support.
Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about the Roman martyrs in Louisville, Kentucky, see about our pilgrimages, and find other episodes that you might be interested in. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at americancatholichistory.org, find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash americancatholichistory, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you.